<laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, to <clears throat> yeah, can't talk. <clears throat> Let's start by just uh, going through a little bit of the correct answers here on this test. So there's some stuff I'll just read through the solution and then uh, some others that will kind of go through in detail. Um, if there's questions at the end, we can do some talk about some stuff at the end. Sound good? All right, so I'm going to start on part one. That's the no calculator piece. So I think I went and circled all the correct multiple choice responses in there. If you got something wrong, I circled it, right? All right. What's up, John? Yep, what's... Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at the y coordinates, as you're getting closer to, as the x coordinates get closer to zero, the y coordinates go from like <coughs> negative 0.1 to negative 0.01 to negative 0.001 on one side, and then like 0 0.09, 0 0.009, 0 0.001 from the other side. So they're both going to zero. So I can't plug in zero to the equation at the end of the question. Well, what's f of x? Oh, my goodness. You know what? Like, I made a mistake on that. That should be one. Yeah. Hold on. Just, just stop yelling at me if, like, a whole bunch of people at once. How can I answer any questions if somebody's, yes, I made a mistake on that. That should be one. Okay. Okay, so at the end of class, if that mistake has affected you negatively, you can see me and I'll, we'll figure out what the adjustment is and we'll deal with that at the end of class, okay? If that affected you negatively, my apologies, okay? So thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, Yeah, Alex. Are you, are you answering questions? Sure. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Um, for number three, okay. Yeah. Why is the first one? Uh, because if I look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the left, that goes to negative 1. And if I do f of 2, that's the filled in circle at 2, also at negative 1. So they are equal. Does that okay? Yeah, John. Uh, because f of six is negative three, but the limit is at negative one, right? If you look at the point, there's a point filled in at negative three comma six. You just didn't see it. Okay, that's all. Okay. Um. I do want to talk about the free response one in, to, in a little bit of detail. If anybody else has a multiple choice question before we move on to that, though. Okay. Um, so the part A, I don't think anybody got this one fully correct. Um, So the issue is, is that you're doing a composition, right? You have a composition of two functions, but the limit is going into a discontinuity, right? So we can't just plug the limit or push the limit inside the composition and then take the number and plug it in because you're plugging it into a discontinuity point. Okay, so we have to do something a little bit different there. So... If you look at the graph, oops, we notice that the limit as x approaches 4 
of f of x is equal to 2, right? That's the inside piece. But look at how it's approaching 2. It's coming up like this, right? So it's approaching 2 from below. You guys see that? So what I can say then is the limit as x approaches 4 of h of x is really just the limit as x approaches 2 from below of g of x. And if I look at that, that gives me 1. And that's the right reason. Some of, many of us got the right answer for the wrong reason, where you plug the, did the substitution, or pushed the limit inside, did the substitution, said, OK, that evaluates to this. Can't do that at a discontinuity, though. So you had to, I had to see that extra step. Does that, you guys see what I'm saying there? You're looking at your pictures? Or no? Yeah, Michael? Yeah. So like on the, oops, on the test, most of you guys did something like, did this, right? Or something pretty similar, right? That's the right answer for the wrong reason. The reason that this is incorrect is that G is added, or two is a discontinuity for G. We can't push that limit inside when we have a discontinuity, when it's added discontinuity. Um, so that's why we did, what I did was the workaround, where I didn't ever push that in like the inside became my x approaches a new value, and then we can look at it. So I never pushed the limit inside. That's the that was the difference. Either way, you got the same answer, but the reasoning mattered there for me. So again, if you had the right answer for the wrong reasons, I think I gave you like one out of the two there, as long as you had something reasonable to get to the get to your answer. Well, something that's like to support getting to your answer. Yeah. So. Uh... Then you could have done exactly like what you've done there. Yeah, if those two points connected and there's no discontinuity, perfect, no problem. But that was that was the issue that we had to be careful on there. And that was honestly like I thought the trickiest thing on either half was realizing that you had to be careful about the discontinuity there. I don't think anybody got it, so don't feel bad. Um, the next one says k of x is f of x plus g of x. And we want to look at negative 1 and 2 and decide if uh, that function k is continuous at either of those two points. So to show continuity, we have to show that the limit at x approaches negative 1 is equal to, of k of x is equal to k of negative 1, right? But we're given graphs here, so we can't just, like, use our direct substitution rules on this, particularly if negative 1 is a discontinuity, which I think it is for, um, for both functions, f and g, right? So what we have to do is we have to look at the left-hand limit and then the right-hand limit. And then evaluated. So if I look at the left-hand limit, I go to my graph, and what is f doing at negative 1 from the left? Where's that going? 0. 
Okay, and what's G going to from uh, X approaches negative one from the left? Negative one. Okay. Uh, now, how about from the right for F? One, okay, and then G, one. And I can stop right here because I see that those two aren't equal, right? So I know that K is discontinuous or not continuous, either way. It's wealth of nations. No one's listening in. Next door, I can't help it sometimes. It's hard to turn your brain off, you know what I mean? There it is, Wealth of Nations. Um, so I do the same thing now for two. So if I go to my picture here, what's F doing at two from the left? Zero. What's G doing from uh, doing from, at two from the left? One, okay. Uh, how about uh, F from the right at two? Okay, and then G, three. Oh, so those matched. And then what's what does uh, F evaluate at two? What is that? Where's the filled in circle at two? For F, zero. And then for G? One. So that one works, right? Everything is equal to one. That's what that's the work I would have wanted to see. Was looking at the right hand limits, the left hand limits, and then the, the function evaluated. Getting all three of those is what you needed for continuity. Anything short of that would be discontinuous. That's using our limit notations. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, Michael? So first, like when you're doing the functions, okay. What the function evaluates out okay. to be, yes. Um, because this right here is the same as saying the limit exists at negative one. Is the left hand and the right hand agree? That means the limit exists. Um, now, if this was a function, we could go possibly straight to the limit existing depending on what the function was. But since we have graphs, we have to, we can't do a direct substitution thing, right? We have to look at the picture and look at left and rights. Um, part C would be done almost exactly the same way. So it says determine the type of discontinuity at x equals four. It's telling you it's discontinuous, so I know what's gonna happen. There's three things that could happen, correct, for discontinuity. So you could have a jump where the left-hand limit doesn't equal the right-hand limit. You could have a removable where the left-hand limit does equal the right-hand limit, but we're not defined there. Or you could have an infinite discontinuity where you have some kind of vertical asymptote, right? So again, to check this, I'm just going to look at the limit as it goes uh, as x approaches 4 from the left, from the right, and then j of 4. So doing the exact same thing. So when I do that, what do I get for f as x approaches uh, neg or 4 from the left? 2. I heard, right? And then what about G? We're looking at four from the left. Negative three, right? That gives us zero. So if I look at four from the right, what does F evaluate to? Two, right? And then G from the right. Still negative three, correct? Still getting zero. 
Well, what's j of 4 give us? What's, what does uh, f evaluate at 4? 0. And what does g evaluate at 4? Negative 3. So I get 12 there. So what this is what this should be telling me is the graph does something like that, right? With the left hand limit, the right hand limit come in, but when I evaluate there, it's not the limit, it's something, something else. What is this called? Now this is a removable. Jump is like where the left hand limit doesn't equal the right hand limit. There's a jump. Is that okay? So again, this was, you know, this question by far was the hardest for you guys on the first page, um, knowing what to do with the graphs and how to get the limits to come out of them. And even using our definition of continuity really effectively was seemed like all we struggled with. And that's okay, <coughs> right? But I wanted to make sure we went through that because well, it's one of those that, like, once you know what to do, it's not that bad. But it seemed like we had a heart. We didn't really have a good feel as to what to do there. Um, looking now to part two, let me read through some solutions there. So number one should have been seven eighths. Number two was twenty one. Number three is three fifths. Number four is one. <clears throat> number five is zero. Number six is negative five. Number three is five. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, seven is what I meant there. Thank you. Um, and then eight A should have been negative 17 for K. Part B, you should have gotten a removable discontinuity. And then uh, for part two, you had two y-intercept or y, uh, horizontal asymptotes at y equals one and y equals negative three over two. Yeah. So again, it asks, what type of discontinuity do we have at x equals zero? So I'm going to just be checking the left-hand limit, the right-hand limit, and then what the function evaluates out to. So if I look at my f of x this time, we have a, a function defined, right? So guess what I can do now? Because I have continuity, at least over the pieces of my piecewise function, I can do direct subs, right? So if I look at x approaching 0 from the left, that means I'm using the middle piece of my piecewise, right? If I'm looking at x approaches 0 from the right, I'm using the third piece of my piecewise. So I get 3 equals 3 over 1. That looks good. And then f of 0 is undefined, right? Because if I look at my piecewise function, 0 is not included in any of the pieces. So what do we have then? Something that looks like this. Removable discontinuity. Does that feel okay, John? So if the number seven says that the function is less than x, it's not like less than x. I got, I got five triple for x. Mm -hmm. How wide can that is not exist? It's not less than x. Why isn't it does not exist? Yeah. Squeeze theorem.
squeeze theorem is you use if the two limits if you have that inequality we use the and they both give you the same limit squeeze theorem says that that middle one's got to have the same limit Right, so you have to show that the limits of the two ends also give you the same thing. Oh, and, okay. so you need to show that. Yeah, so you have to do three things, right? You have to show the limit of 10 e to the x minus 21 over 2 e to the x is equal to 5. And then the limit of 5 square root x over square root x minus 1 is equal to 5. And then state by the squeeze theorem, the limit as f of x, or the limit of f of x is equal to 5. But did you write down the limit, what the limits were for the, the two sides on your paper? Or did you just draw a picture and say the limit for this is 5? That does that's you have to say it okay. like for the to use the squeeze theorem you have to explicitly say it right like as me being picky I know you drew the picture but all the picture does is show me that like okay the inequality holds right without saying the limit is yeah. you know for this is this and the limit for that is that like can't use the squeeze theorem is what I is what I was trying to say there and what I probably gave you two out of three yeah John you. yep uh, just is there a follow up on this seven piece right now? Uh, this is kind of like for uh, six and seven plus. Okay. Just like the, for the ones where there's like same power in the numerator and the denominator, um, it's like the shortcut is just like the prohibition or whatever. Like, how do you like show it for the, like the rest of the numbers? Right. So if you use the graph, you can just look at like the left end of the graph if the x is appropriately long enough, right? If you built a table, if you go like, you know, negative 100, negative 1,000, negative 10,000 or something like, and looked at the y's, that would be appropriate there. If you're doing it algebraically, um, you know, like what you'd wanna do is multiply the top and bottom by like 1 over x to the fifth. Because if we do that, I'd have something like this, right? When I push that limit through, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and this goes to zero. If I just do like so that's then just negative five. Um so like to do it, if you're going to do it algebraically, you got to do it algebraically. If you're going to use a table, that's fine. Use the table. If you're going to use a graph, that's fine. Use the graph. But if it's algebraic, we got to do something algebraically. We can't just like, you know, do one of these and say negative five. Even though if it was a multiple choice question, that's exactly what you should do. But if the directions say like we have to show, you know, like you should show, you know, include uh, algebraic steps or justifications or you know, build a graph and explain what you did or build a table and, you know, like, just need a little bit more than just on a problem where the directions say that, like, you need to give a justification than just, you know, like, circling the pieces and kind of doing something. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, John, you said 8A? 8A. Okay. Um, so the key here is that we have continuity. So we know that the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right, which is equal to f of negative 1. That's the first thing you should write. If I do the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left, that's going to be the first piece. 
So I'm just going to do a direct substitution and plug in negative 1. And uh, as x approaches negative 1 from the right, that's going to be using the second piece. So again, I'll just do a direct substitution. And I have an equation with just k in it that I can solve. So this, like that was the key, was realizing that because of continuity, I can say this. And I would have wanted to see that as like a step in there somewhere. Like some people had this and were able to get 17, but I don't think anybody justified why you could say that. Um, because there's no reason from what you're given in the equation that those two things should be equal, right? So the continuity step there, you needed to use that. Even if you said because of continuity and then set the two things equal, I would have been okay with that. Um, but we needed to do something to justify getting those two things equal because they're clearly not written as equal in the problem, right? Like you used something else to say that they were equal. Does that make sense as to what I was looking for there? Um, so I think one point for the continuity, one point for, you know, like setting the equation up and like one point to solve it to the finish. Michael? Yeah, so this is, this was exactly a homework question, I think. In fact, it was a homework quiz question even, I think. Um, so this is the one that we're talking about, right? Okay, so if I'm doing this algebraically, I can break my limit. Like this, right? Oops. That's okay to do. Because both of those are continuous functions, right? So this first piece we know is zero. That was one of our definitions or formulas or whatever that we had. This, though, the limit of the cosine piece, we can't, we don't know what that is, right? But because we know that negative 1 or cosine is always going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. We know that this is going to be a finite number, right? It's not infinity. 0 times anything between negative 1 and 1 is still going to be 0. The thing we have to worry about is what if this limit is infinity? Because 0 times infinity is not 0. That's one of those indeterminate forms. So we just had to do enough to say that, like, I know that's not infinite. Um, some of us drew the picture on that and that was good but then we said it never equals zero or never touches zero and I'm like well it absolutely does you know if cosine or if x is 2 pi cosine of pi over 2 is zero and zero times you know like e to the negative 2 pi is going to be zero so like got to be careful about if we're saying more than we need to right Especially if, more, if what we say more than we need to is wrong, right? Like, so I know it feels picky, but I think these are things that like an AP grader would also be picky about. Just be careful about, you want to say enough, but not more than you need to. And certainly you want to be careful about, if you say something never or always does something, that you want to be right on that. Um, especially if it doesn't really matter, right? For a limit, it doesn't matter if it, if it, you know, if you go past the limit and then come back to the limit and go past and come back, as long as it settles down to the limit, you know, I think you're, I think it's going to be okay. But that's, that's the extra piece that you needed to do for that one to say it's zero, is that you needed to at least state that that, you know that that other limit is not infinity. And the easiest way to do that is just cosine is bounded. You know, that was the trickiest of the limit ones for that particular part, is that uh, not a lot of us made sure to say that extra piece, even though I think most of us got zero, you know, 
got to the right thing. And again, if this is a multiple choice question, no problem, right? The fact that this was a, you know, wanting justification, wanting some backup for how we're getting to our answers. Um, how do you guys, does this feel like this is helpful in terms of clarifying like what Mr. Kulik's looking for, like what the work for this kind of problem looks for, like how do I actually go about doing this? What's the difference between like doing one of these limits when I have a graph versus an equation? Um, you know, like the conceptual part is hard. And this chapter I think is in semester one is maybe the hardest conceptual chapter because it's all so new and there's not a lot of like symbol push like we're kind of used to. Like it doesn't feel very mathy, it feels like something else. And I know that makes it hard. Um, what do you guys, do you guys feel any better about like what was going on or what you need to do or what I was looking for, any of that more stuff? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, for me, hey, yes. I, I don't know, I showed it on the board, I didn't do it very clear, but uh, it's slogan. And like I got the uh, like the kind of an equation with the uh, variable k, mm -hmm. and I solved uh, I solved it out, mm -hmm. and uh, and you got negative seventeen. Yeah, like, and I gave you two out of three. No, I know, but like, okay. how would you like said like why like I don't know like how would I show that? So the reason is the your justification is is because f is continuous at negative four, we can say this because that is what you did here, and this is what you did here. So you need some reason why those two things were equal. Like you said, them equal to each other, but they're just pieces of a piecewise function. Why should one piece equal the other piece? They don't have to, but because they really only are equal because, or we know that because we're told that we have continuity at that point. So even if you had said because f is continuous at 4 and then wrote your equation that you described, that I would have even given you credit for. Okay, so I have to say like plus number three. You, I mean, if you're going to set two things equal that aren't listed as equal, you have to give like some kind of justification as like why those need to be equal, right? Like they can't, you can't just make two things equal, right? Um, or even if you said like, you know, like... Uh, because this is continuous, I know the left hand side, left hand limit has to equal the right hand limit, wrote in words, and then set them equal and did it. Like, cool. You know, we're like, you know, the, this thing all needs to connect together. That's fine. That'll do. Um, you know what I mean, Michael? Yeah. So just like one extra little piece there would have been would have been sufficient. All right, um, are we ready to put these guys aside here and move on? Okay. Um, All right. I have good news for you today. We're about to make the process of finding a derivative way simpler because here come shortcuts. Yes, sir. So like, we'll, we'll do some examples about, and it'll depend on the directions a little bit, Alex, too. Um, and I'll give you guys some examples here in a minute of, or maybe not even today, but I'll give you some examples of where we need like that limit definition for a derivative and where that's useful and what kind of problems that would be useful to do versus where the shortcuts are going to be useful. Um, so I, I definitely do want to do that because that's a great question. The obvious first question, right, is like, 
okay, you're giving me shortcuts, like, what can I do or not do with these things? Um, and we'll get to that and sorting that out. And if you still aren't, you know, if it's still not clear, like, ask me again in a little bit when you've gotten through some of these. Okay. Um, so, series of equations, so, or for, uh, definitions, or whatever you want to call this. First is the derivative of a constant. What's the slope of the line, like y equals c? Zero. What's the derivative going to be? Zero. If you wanted to prove that with our limit definition, well, I do the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Well, f of x plus h is just c. And f of x is just c. c minus c is zero. So we have the limit of zero, which is zero. Everybody's okay? That's just the proof. Do you need the proof? No. Would I ever ask you to like reprove something like that? Using a limit definition? I would not. But it's a AP calculus class. There's probably people in the room that are fancy themselves future mathematicians or engineers. We'll, should be getting used to seeing proof for theorems. I'm going to try to do a lot of that. The, the proofs are not repeatable, or not things I would ask you to repeat, but they are things that I'd actually like, can you follow what we did? Okay. Um, the next one, the derivative of x is equal to 1. Again, what's the slope of the line y equals x? 1. So the derivative is 1. How do we prove that? Well, we just use our limit definition. So if f of x is equal to x, what's f of x plus h? You mean x plus h? And what's f of x? x. So I'm left with just, you know, cancels out. I'm left with h over h or just 1. I feel good. Okay. Uh, what if I just have a generic power function? Now notice here that the, the rule says if n is a positive integer, remind me again what's a positive integer? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, not including fractions, not including 0, not including negatives. <laughs> Guess what? It really works for all of those except for zero, but that doesn't matter. What's x to the zero? One. What's the derivative of one? Zero. <laughs> okay, so it turns out that this will work really nicely. Should we prove this? Yeah, might as well. Did you guys, did you guys do the binomial theorem last year in Algebra 2? Yes or no would be appropriate here. The binomial expansion, maybe you called it? To foil things out, like the quantity x plus h to the n? Yeah, using combinations? Oops, I should say A. Right? Does that look familiar? <laughs> That's just the binomial formula. I'm just proving this, right? Like it's not something you'll need to repeat. Look at how simple the formula is. The exponent becomes the coefficient. You subtract one from the exponent. In practice, super duper easy to do. I'm just proving it right now. That's all I'm trying to do. Okay? So I'm going to 
say I have, I'm going to do part of this summation. Is that okay? Actually, I'll do it with like an ellipsis in it. That'll be easier for you guys to see what's going on. Really? All right, so uh, did the binomial expansion. I just did a dot, dot, dot in the middle to, in the interest of like not writing down basically something infinitely long. Um, if I look at this, n choose zero is just n, or I'm sorry, is one. So this guy and this guy cancel out. Everything else has an h, a factor of h in it. So I can do that. So far, so good. And if I do my direct substitution in for h, the only thing left is because everything else has an h in it, and the h's all go to zero, right? Everybody's okay. And if you remember, n choose one is just n. So that's that's how you'd prove that. You use the binomial theorem or binomial expansion to do that. Again, am I going to ask you to repeat that ever? No. But I want you to get used to seeing, like, what does proof in mathematics look like when we state something we'd like to prove it. Um, let's do some examples here now using these three things that we use that we have just identified the three rules shortcuts so we have x to the sixth if i take the derivative of that the exponent becomes the coefficient and then i subtract one so the derivative of x to the sixth is just six x to the fifth look at how easy that is i can do it like without even writing anything down in fact there's no work to write down if I do the derivative of y to the fourth, and say dy dt is equal to, and then the exponent becomes the coefficient, so four, and then we subtract one from the exponent, so four t to the third. What do you guys think? Get the idea? Isn't that lovely? Like way better than doing that limit nonsense googly gox that takes like a half a sheet of paper to work through a problem on, right? And in general, if n is any real number, this still applies. So the previous theorem we did was only for positive integers. We needed that to do the binomial expansion. If I'm not going to prove this version because it's a lot more complicated. Um, but it holds for any real numbered value for n. So if n is a rational number, no big deal. Irrational number, still fine. You know, positive, negative, zero, all works. So how would I do something like finding the derivative of x or uh, of one over x squared? I want to first start by using some algebra to rewrite this. Ben? Can you change this to x with the negative exponent? Yes, exactly right. Let's make that x to the negative 2. So when I do the derivative, what do I get? To the, nope, negative 3. Because we subtract 1 from the exponent. Or we could write this as 2 over, I'm sorry, negative 2 over x to the third. Feel okay? How about uh, y equals the cube root of x squared? Yeah, so we'll write as x to the two thirds. So our derivative is two thirds x to the negative one-thirds, or we could write as two, 
3 cube root uh, x. Everybody's okay there? Again, in general, negative exponents are fine, but if it's a multiple choice question, they're probably not going to give you the negative exponents. They're probably going to simplify it so that it has positive exponents. That's typically what I see when I look at previous AP exams, how they format their answers. Um, so far, so good? Pretty straightforward, right? I like it, Mr. Kulik. Uh, what if I want to find the equation of the tangent and normal line to the curve y equals x squared of x at the point 1, 1? So to graph the equation for a line, I need a point, I have that 1, 1, and a slope. How am I going to get the slope at 1, 1 for the equation y equals x squared of x? I'm going to use the derivative. Okay. Can I take the derivative of y equals x times the square root of x as it's currently written? No, we don't know how to do the product of two functions. But what can how, can we rewrite x square root x in a way that we would be able to? Okay. Still multiplication in there, though, so we have to be able to do more than that. Yeah, so remember, x is just x to the first. So the derivative, then, should be x to the positive 1 half, right? Because 3 over 2 minus 1 is a half. Okay. So if I want, then... My slope for the tangent is just going to be plugging 1 in. Right? And the slope for the normal is going to be the... What is the relationship between a normal line and a tangent line? Perpendicular. So negative reciprocal, right? So we say y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 for the tangent, and y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 for the normal. Cool beans? No big deal? Boy, that's a nice way of finding those derivatives, isn't it? All right. Uh, more derivative shortcuts. So I have a, if I have the derivative of a constant times the function, I can just pull the constant out front, do the derivative, and then multiply the constant back in afterwards. It can just hang out out front. So, for example, if I have the derivative of 3x to the fourth, I can pull the 3 out front. What's the derivative of x to the fourth? 4x cubed. So when I multiply the 3 back in, I got 12x cubed. This is nice, Mr. Kulik. This is way, way simpler. How about this next one? What do I get here? Derivative of negative x. Yeah, you just pull the negative off. It's negative 1. You probably could have done that without even looking at it, right? All right, the sum rule, guess what? The derivative distributes. So if I have the derivative of the sum of two functions, I can just distribute the derivative and take each derivative separately. Lovely. If it works for addition, guess what? It can work for subtraction too. You guys are so smart. All right, so let's take a look at this one. What if I want to do the derivative of x to the 8? plus 12x to the fifth, minus 4x to the fourth, plus 10x to the third, minus 6x, plus 5. Well, I'm going to use my derivative rules, so I can distribute that through, and I can pull the constants out front. You guys feel okay with what I'm doing right now? 
Any questions as I write this out? You're following the logic, I hope. So what do I have? I have 8x to the 7th then, plus 60x to the 4th, uh, minus 16x to the 3rd, plus 30x squared, minus 6, plus 0. Everybody's okay with that? And what I did? Yeah? Ms. Kulik, do I have to show this step? No, man. You just go straight to the answer. If you can do it in your head, do it in your head. If you need to show the step, show the step. No big deal. But if you can just go straight through, go straight through. They're going to get a lot more complicated than this to do with shortcuts even. So if you can do polynomials in your head, please do them in your head. So far, so good? All right. Uh, it says, find the points on the curve y equals x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 4, where the tangent line is horizontal. What uh, tangent line is horizontal? What's that mean? Slope is 0. So I want to find where y prime is equal to 0. Okay, who can tell me what y prime is equal to? about 4x cubed minus 12x. That feel okay? You see what I did? I just took the derivative of my function for y. How do I solve something like that? Okay, uh, can we take more than an x? Yeah, let's take a 4x, right? Okay. And then what do we do? Okay, by doing... Perfect. Set each factor equal to 0. So what's the solution to 4x equals 0? Perfect. What's the solution to x uh, squared minus 3 equals 0? Perfect. Everybody feel good? Um, now keep in mind it said points. These are just the x coordinates. How am I going to find the y? Which equation? The original. So then I'll do like y of 0. So I get 4. So I'd have like 0, 4, etc. I'm not going to plug them all back in because it's just... And that fire drill really took the steam out of it here. I don't know if it's a drill even. I usually don't do two in one day. All right. Uh, the equation of motion of a particle S is, or of, of a particle is S equals yada, 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 where S is measured in centimeters and T in seconds. Find the acceleration as a function of time, and then what is the acceleration after two seconds? Remind me again, what is the relationship between position and acceleration? Which derivative? It's the second derivative of position, right? Because velocity is the first derivative. That's a relationship you should want to remember. Position, velocity, acceleration. That's the order. Just derivative, derivative. Okay, so we'll start with S. The first derivative is uh, 6t squared minus... Then what? Plus, we're well here, 3. And then plus 0, right? And then our acceleration then is the derivative of position or the second derivative, or derivative of velocity or the second derivative. So that's going to just be 12t minus 10. 
Are we good with how I got that? So A of 2 is just twenty four minus ten or fourteen centimeters per second. Oops, squared. Because it's acceleration, right? It's always time squared. What do you think? If you say so, Mr. Kulik. Uh, so remember the definition we used for E way back in uh well, algebra two or maybe in pre-calculus. I don't remember where we do it. No? Here's another definition using a limit. Who cares? I don't. This one, though, I care about. It's a shortcut. What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. I love that one. What's the 12th derivative of e to the x? <laughs> you get the idea here, right? Okay. That's it. Um, so the uh, this homework should feel a bit more mathy than usual because it's just going to be like, here's a list of equations, do the derivatives to them, or like, here's a function, find where the slope is has this value. Okay, take the derivative, solve for whatever the value is. It's going to feel like you're asking to do things that you're used to doing, like simplifying expressions and solving for whatevers. It won't be, it's not, like we're taking a conceptual break for a little bit, and we're just going to learn some simple pushing shortcuts, which are probably like, yes. I feel good about pushing those symbols. I have lots of experience doing that. Um, so just looking ahead, we're going to do next how we do after today. We'll do how do you do the derivative of a product or quotient of sequences or of functions. We'll look at how you do derivatives of trig functions and trig inverses. How do you do the derivative of a composition of two functions? And then how do you do the derivative with respect to a different variable? So if I have a function like a you know, that's like x squared times y minus y cubed x plus 7. Like, how do I do the derivative of something like that, where x's and y's are maybe unseparable? And then we'll do, how do we do logs? Derivative of logs. And then that's probably right about the next test, right? Oh, and then I've I have two more things in there. Rates of change in natural. I don't know if I'll actually do that. And then uh, approx linear approximation. So what was the Probably. These are usually, this usually goes pretty nice, these sections. These are pretty like just doing symbol pushing. Is the only homework due Sunday 2.8? That's a great question. Let me look in what I have assigned. Uh, so I have 2, 1, and 2. That's, why don't I have any grades in for that now? Yeah. So let's, you know what, guys? Let's just put 2 8 into. Uh, oh, there they all came in. That's so weird. Uh, let's just put 2 8 into next week's homework. And because we only meet one time next week because we lose. I don't see you guys on Tuesday because we have that community service thing. I'll see you at community service, though. I get to go. Um, so. Let's just do it next week. We'll have 2, 8, and 3, 1 as next week's problem set. Deal? Everybody, nobody's upset about that. Okay. Uh, if you add test point adjustments, if I need to adjust your points.